Um, Bill Mook is our first presenter. He is the owner of Mook Sea Farm, an oyster farm in the Damascotta River, founded in 1985. His company raises oysters from eggs to market size and sells seed oysters to other East Coast growers. So that's a big, bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> He is a member of the NECAN Steering Committee, that's the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, and serves on the Steering Committee for OA Information Exchange, um, Ocean Acidification Information Exchange, which is an initi initiative by the Federal Interagency Working Group on Ocean Acidification. He's a member of Maine's Ocean Acidification Commission, which issued a report summarizing the state of ocean and coastal acidification science and recommended actions that Maine could take to address the threat posed by acidification to Maine's marine resources. His topic here today is business economics and innovation, the evolution of a shellfish farm. Thank you, Bill. So I can, I can hit just the arrow button on the Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Just wave at me, Bill, if you want me. All right. So uh, I would like to start right off by saying that part, partly this is directed, I hope, towards people who are maybe in the room thinking of getting into this or maybe you've just started. And uh, I'm going to try to run through this stuff pretty fast so there's some time at the end. You can ask questions. What I'm hoping is that some of the things that I've learned over this long time span uh, can be useful to people who are getting into this field now. So uh, as you can see from the, uh, the intro slide, I'm going to start off with sort of uh, you know, where we're located, uh, sort of some key events that have taken place over the 33 years. That's, that's a third of a century that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, as you'll see from the timeline, we've, we really had to be, and I think anybody in this industry has to uh, learn about problem solving. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to really go through our business process, how we, how we do what we do from a technical standpoint, and what you're gonna see is sort of the end result of all the evolution that's going on over this period of time. And then I'm gonna talk about sort of the future, uh, this new building that we're about to move into that we just built, uh, and, and sort of what our research and development ideas are, and then a little bit about um, how we view ourselves in the, in the spectrum of, of uh, companies in terms of capitalism. So. This is the Damariscotta River. It's a gorgeous aerial shot that shows the entire river from the uh, twin villages of Damariscotta and Newcastle all the way to the Gulf of Maine. And I've labeled along the, the length of the estuary uh, some of our own key sites. Uh, EL3 is our oldest uh, surface aquaculture lease. Perkins Point is our bigger lease that uh, we converted to suspension culture in 2012. Uh, our hatchery is located a little further south. And then the ICDC, that's the Iris C. Darling Center, the University of Maine's field station. And then PI stands for Peters Island. That is the site where we uh, move oysters in for winter harvest so that we can be a year-round uh, harvester of market oysters. Um, this is uh, a recent site plan that we had done to, for uh, putting up our new building. but. But the point I want to make here is that if you come down off Route 29 towards the Damariscotta River, we have a, a, our old packing plant, a maintenance building, the new building sort of right in the middle of the lot, and then the hatchery and the wharf are right down by the water. And uh, a key point with this is that we have a very narrow toehold on, on the river. Real estate is uh, expensive in Midcoast, Maine. And that has shaped kind of how some of the problems and some of the ways we've developed our technology over the years. And I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, this is the timeline that I was talking about. And I'm going to get some. I, can. I guess I won't do that. I'm just going to talk loudly. So in the early years, uh, we started in 1985. I can divide this into basically three segments. The, the beginning years where we were producing all kinds of uh, bivalve seed. We established our leases on the river. We designed and built a tidal upweller so we had nursery capacity out on the river. Uh, we, we worked on our grow out. We were doing uh, bottom culture of oysters. We, did, we were growing out surf clams and, sco and sco uh, bay scallops. Um, Things were going along pretty well. We were developing, and then boom, uh, we were in the, the uh, hatchery season of 1998. We were unable to grow any cohort of any shellfish through the hatchery. 
and I came that close to going out of business by the end of 1998. And it turns out we were shut down by a neighbor who was illegally dumping septic waste, which included, what happened was in 1997, he more than doubled the number of porta potty units that he was uh, using, and all of that was going into the Damascot River, probably about 100 yards from our pumps that we were pumping water into the hatchery fund. So we, we literally, and he was doing it with, with in a time uh, scale that matched our larval production cycle so that we would do a spawn, they might grow for a little while and look kind of normal, and then boom, all of a sudden we'd get hammered and, uh, and, and they would die. So, so that was the first big thing. We, we figured it out. We vowed that we were going to really uh, learn how to um, control the life cycle of these species that we were growing. Um, we, we went through a recovery phase, and during that phase, we decided to just focus on American oysters. Um, and then we, and we also, during that time, this is a really key thing that we did uh, beginning in about 2004. We developed a new system which is proprietary for how we grow the microalgae food that we use in the hatchery. So uh, that was a big deal, and, and it's really um, been the key to a lot of what we've been able to do in the States. <laughs> then we hit another uh, big, I, I put them in red here, uh, the, the winter of 2009, uh, and the winter and spring was incredibly wet and rainy, uh, and we ran face you know, head on into ocean acidification problems with lowered pH. Uh, it was very similar to what happened on the West Coast. We actually met with some West Coast growers later that year, and uh, th that was kind of the start of figuring out the next big problem. And it, it didn't devastate us to the extent that this problem did, but it, but it really uh, put a crimp on our larval production, and we lost money that year. Um, so, since we figured that out, and I'll talk a little bit about how what we do about that now, because it's something we live with all the time now, um, the, the, the rest of this period has been sort of, okay, we kind of figured out what we're going to, what to do, how to grow these shellfish and do it dependably, but how do you do it all the time? And so, there's been a, a, a big period of, of, you know, innovation through here where we've develop successful strategies to uh, deal with ocean acidification. We monitor all of our seawater chemistry. We converted leases to suspension culture. And, and another big, huge uh, step in the evolution of the company was switching from bottom culture of oysters to suspension culture using these oyster grow cages, which were developed in Canada about a decade before this. And, um, and then in terms of management, we, adopt, we realized how important hatchery production is. We adopted uh, a lot of what was, uh, there was a guy named Atul Gawande who uh, wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto. That is sort of a Bible. Amanda uh, Clapp, who's sitting in the audience, is one of our, the people who works in our hatchery. She can tell you about all the checklists we have all around the hatchery. And that's been a huge um, factor in providing uh, real dependability in our seed production. Um, and then we also began our year-round harvesting. We, we uh, acquired some winter sites where we could take our cages so we could uh, operate year-round. So then we also fully developed our leases. We now have 5,000 oyster grow cages that we grow oysters in. Uh, we upped the education level of all of our hatchery workers. Uh, we converted our winter uh, sites to regular leases. Um, we you know, our market oyster revenue started to exceed our seed sales revenue during this period. Uh, we hired a director of research and development, and I'll talk about that a little bit, and, and of course the, the new facility as well. We started working on that. So, problem solving. So you can see that we confronted a bunch of problems. A lot of them were ones that uh, kind of slammed us upside of the head, but some of them were also realizing as we got into this that there are things that could just be done better and in large part, we're always, and it's a theme throughout the whole 33 years, of trying to do um, more production in less space with less energy. And so you'll see that as we go through when we get to the process part of this. But, but there's some important things that we've learned about problem solving. One is that it helps to be, in fact, it's kind of uh, critical that you're persistent. Secondly, you have to be able to uh, be open to change. You have to embrace reconsidering things that you held uh, to be in, in violent before. For example, if you had asked me uh, before 2010 about the idea of growing oysters to market size and cages on the surface, I would have laughed. 
And, uh, and so that's an example of, well, okay, we got a couple in there, we tried them, and said, hey, these things work. And so we did all the economics, we, we looked at the cost effectiveness of it, and, and it's been a huge uh, factor in our success since that point. Uh, it helps to know a little about a lot. I strongly urge young people to get an interdisciplinary education. To do the kind of stuff we do, you've got to know uh, an awful lot about, uh, or an awful little about a lot of different things. But you also need to know people who know a lot about a little. So you can call on them to come in and help you. And, and of course, necessity is truly the mother of invention. Uh, and then another point I'd like to make about problem solving is that in business, uh, and I came at all this, as you'd probably be able to tell, from the scientific end. I, I was in graduate school in oceanography at the Darling Center. And so one of the things that I learned being a business person is that problem solving has to, you, you have to go to a, it's, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt, which is you know 95% confidence intervals. You need to make business decisions based on the preponderance of credible evidence and, um, and the weight of the evidence. And, and essentially, that, that brings me to the whole climate change you know, aspect of this, which I know can be controversial, but from where I sit, the uh, weight of the evidence is very clear on that. And, and I'm, you're looking at somebody who has dealt with a lot of the things and is dealing with a lot of the things that are happening, the changes that are occurring in our environment. And it, a big part of what we do now is try to figure out where all of that is going and how we're going to respond to that. So now we'll talk about the process. And I always say that the hatchery is the engine that drives the business. It's, it's very true. Everything hinges on that hatchery running flawlessly. And the microalgae, the single cell plants that we have to culture to feed everything in the hatchery, that's the fuel. So you've got to have good fuel. You've got to have a good engine and you've got to have good fuel. And in the hatchery, we basically deal with every single aspect of an oyster's life cycle. So we start with brood stock, and we, we obtain, we ripen them, we have to feed them and ripen them, we obtain our eggs from there, we fertilize the eggs, they develop into these free swimming larvae that, uh, that are free swimming for a couple weeks, and then they go through a metamorphosis, and we, and we let them, uh, it's called setting on screens, and they attach to a little piece of shell chip, and then we grow them in various systems until they're big enough to sell. And all the while, we're growing a, a whole bunch of microalgae uh, to be able to, um, to feed all the different uh, life stages in the hatchery. So, and of course, water quality is absolutely crucial. So we pump our water from the Dermascutter River. Uh, we filter our water down to, uh, those are uh, five micron bag inside a one micron bag. Uh, it's all automated. You can see all the wires and everything that we've added over the years to tell us when the bags are filling up, to turn pumps on and off and maintain the level in the head tank. Uh, but, and then that water goes through uh, plumbing down into the hatchery where it's heated to the right temperature, and we also uh, UV irradiate all the water that we use within the hatchery. Um, we hold our brood stock in this brood stock quarantine facility. It allows us to bring uh, every brood stock we bring into the hatchery uh, from outside of the Dermascutter River, we presume is disease. So we, tr we make that assumption and we hold everything very carefully. Uh, all the water is collected and heavily disinfected prior to being released to uh, the river. And, uh, and it allows us to uh, be very aware of the genetics of the seed we're producing. We produce these disease-resistant uh, uh, oysters. And we can select for, uh, there's a lot of genetics that go into the, into the uh, production of the larvae. Um, so this is, a, this is a female oyster producing eggs. And you'll, I was hoping there was sound because the Marvin Gaye is absolutely critical to <laughs> that, that goes on. But, but that's really where it starts. We take those eggs and we fertilize them. Uh, they grow into these free swimming larvae. You can see that all the dark brown, that's all food that they filtered out of the water. But the, these, this is a critical first step. And, and it, it's easy to say, well, larvae are sort of a dime a dozen because you get so many of them, they're so easy to get. But if you mess up on your spawning and on your larval production, it throws off your whole production schedule for the season. So this is a really critical part of the hatchery production. 
They, they hold the larvae in two different types of systems, depending on their size and, and what we're doing. But we, the, the old-fashioned way of these big tanks, static cultures at low density, and then we also use uh, small tanks that are flow through. Um, here, their, their larvae are being drained out of one of the big tanks in these sieves. We grade them, we restock them at the right density. They're fed continuously while they're in, in culture. And then, uh, and this is where uh, your greenhouse gas emissions come to play. We are, we have to buffer the water every time we do a water change. And we, we use, this is uh, sodium carbonate, is a common buffer used, uh, raises the pH and uh, if we don't do that, we don't have predictable, regular uh, uh, larval production. When, when we do buffer, we get fast growth, we get high survival rates, and we get a very high conversion, which is something we hadn't really originally thought of, but um, you have healthy larvae that make it through to the end of the larval cycle, you get a high yield uh, that convert into the post-set juveniles. So after the larvae are, are competent to go through the metamorphosis, they're put into this system, again, this used to take up the whole side of the hatchery. We cut the tanks down to about six inches or eight inches deep, stack them in a, in a basically a tray system, and then each of these have screens, three screens that fit in. Each screen, we put a million and a half larvae. We put a bunch of really finely ground up shell chip in the bottom, and the, the larvae attach to these little pieces of shell chip and turn into a, a typical you know, it looks now like a regular uh, self-respecting bottom-dwelling oyster. And that, that shows you the lighter color on these screens is the shell chip. The dark brown are the uh, larvae that have attached to the shell chip and have started to grow. Uh, then we grow the, the uh, seed, the post set, through a series of different systems, that, uh, all of which, you know, we, we're working on this small footprint. Uh, and we're, and we're recirculating the water, which saves us a lot of, uh, we use propane to eat our water now, but uh, it, it's an energy saving thing. So this is where the oysters coming right out of that setting system go, these little silos, we can hold a lot of oysters. We actually just started this up this year, it's been really successful. Um, these, when they get a little bigger, they go into these static upwelling systems, and then finally, they get into these Coke bottles, which are, uh, um, they're kind of like a lava lamp. You're injecting food and filtered seawater in the bottom, and the oysters are circulating within those tubes. It's really a pretty cool thing to see. Uh, I did have a video, but I, I, I decided not to throw it in here for the sake of time. Um, anyway, this is, we, we basically get them to this size, and then we can, we move them into, this is called the juvenile inventory room. We actually developed the technology we use here with a, um, with the incubator, the main Aquaculture Innovation Center's incubator center, the Darling Center. We test it out uh, using, um, you know, very high density, low temperature, but we're feeding the oysters, keeping them healthy, growing slowly, and it allows us to build up huge levels of biomass in this fairly small room. It's a research system. In the back there, there's a big, protein skimmer, which acts like a little oyster sewage treatment plant, and we recirculate the water back through. Uh, we hold them at cold temperatures, I mentioned, and that allows us to build up you know, tens of millions of oysters in here, and then when conditions are appropriate to be able to ship seed to, the, to our seed customers or put them into our own grow-out system, we can take them out of here and move them into nurseries. Yeah, I guess I was supposed to, I think I said all that. All right, so then once you get you know, the oyster seed coming out of the hatchery, um, what I'm gonna talk about now is how we handle them out in our, uh, in our river operations. We, we take those oysters, put them in a whole bunch of these little two millimeter bags. Uh, they go into these oyster grow cages. I'm gonna talk a little more about those in a minute. And then uh, we grow them all the way to market size there, and then uh, they go into our packing plant where we wash them and then pack and ship them over there on that table. And that's part of what we put into the new building, actually. Um, this is a little more on the oyster grow cages. Uh, what's so uh, amazing about them, what's, what's really innovative about them, is it, it allows you, in a fairly labor, uh, you know, efficient manner, to be able to control biopolymer. That's always been the issue with suspension culture, is 
handling a lot of gear and, and killing off all the things that want to settle and grow and follow the bags and the oysters. So what you are able to do with these things is these big floats. So when they're in the growing position like this, the cages are hanging below those floats. You flip them up so the bags that hold the oysters and the, and the cage and everything are exposed to the air, and that allows it to dry out. We do that during the growing season. Every two weeks, we flip them up for at least 24 hours. This, is, this shows you our big release uh, with the cages all laid out in the grid. Uh, we were starting to uh, go through a lot of ibuprofen because to flip those cages when they're full, they, you're talking several hundred pounds, and we were hiring all these young, strong people to do this, and you know, it, it was, we were starting to get some pushback when we hit a couple thousand cages. So we, we knew early on that we needed to come up with a system for handling these things during the different parts of the process, the growing process. So we designed this uh, double hull vessel, which um, allows us to, we, we did also designed this flipping thing, and there is a video here, and I'm now I'm really glad, oh shoot, I wonder if I can, no. Yeah, I'm, it's not, uh, oh wait. There it goes. So, this shows how the cage flipper works. They, they get fed into the beginning, it's a hydraulic system. So we basically used to do this, we had our two guys stand in. I had to cut it off because there was an expletive coming up. <laughs> they were so happy that this thing was working. <laughs> So, uh, so I'll get to this in a minute. You definitely but, can't swear in front of this. No. no. <laughs> so, so uh, it was actually I was kind of ticked off because it, it, it was a really good video, but I couldn't really. It wasn't good for public consumption. Anyway, the uh, the the thing with the flipper was that we were doing this by hand. We have a cage that we'd hang on the side of the boat. Two people would be in the cage. One person driving the boat. So it'd be three people and you rotate through the cage because it gets very tight. And you literally, you put your foot on them and pull them over and shake them. And, uh, and that's a key part of this is that you can over flip them so you, you move the oysters, it keeps their shape good, and it levels them out so that they flow properly. And, um, and I gotta tell you, we, that was the actual first test where we, we figured out those little guides on there. And from that point on, we never flipped any more cages by hand. And you know, it never gets a, has a hangover. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, you go out there, we got it now, so there's two guys in the flipping vessel, one guy driving, one guy just standing there using the hydraulic lever, so it's, it's pretty cool. So, and obviously, the problem with these cages is, in this latitude is that uh, we get some pretty ferocious uh, winter. This is our morph in the winter of 2015. So, you have to sink the cages, so we designed this, um, so th this, th this, uh, Vessel is really like a tractor and land. We have implements that fit into it depending on the time of year. So this is, we call this the spaceship. This is where the cages slide up on there. They're, they're, we flip them up so that the floats are down. They come up on that. There's somebody on either side of that removing the caps. Uh, and then they go into this ramp, which is a 20 foot long ramp that we lower to the bottom. And it's, it's like a big Pez machine. The, the cages just slide down that and they go onto the bottom and we're driving along and they, and they just lays them on the bottom with, uh, with the floats now acting as supports holding the cages and the oysters up off the mud. And there's, there's a picture of the thing operating. And then in the spring we come out, we, just, we have two winches on the top of that thing that we hook onto various cages and we pull them up flush out the floats, put the caps back on, and then off we go, we're ready to start flipping again. This is our seasonal migration. <laughs> These are our, our harvest boats pulling cages. There are 50 cages in a string. They're like about 350 feet long. We pull them seven or eight miles all the way from the upper Damascot River down to our winter site. And then harvesting, this was something when we got into using the oyster grow cages, we didn't realize how the, especially now with all the concern about Vibrio. Um, one of the advantages to this system is that we can harvest literally 30,000 oysters in about half an hour with two boats and have those oysters into our walk-in cooler within an hour and a half. 
the boat, these boats are 28 feet long. We have 150, 200 horse engines on them. So even with a full load of, uh, of, of bags in them, they plane off and go over 20 knots. It's quite, quite something. And, and obviously, you can see here, we're harvesting in all kinds of weather. And then we, we offload them, and then they go right up into the, uh, to the truck, and they go right into the cooler. Uh, this is our old packing plant. Um, and here you, you see them washing the oysters, uh, and then they sort through them, cull and everything, and then, uh, and then they get packed up into the shipping boxes for shipping. And now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the new building. Um, so th this is kind of an equal parts uh, expansion of the business, risk aversion, and, and looking at the future and opportunities that we, are, we see looking forward. And so there, there are basically three parts of the building, um, two of them kind of linked more closely. We have the packing and shipping area. And again, there's a wa same washing machine down there. We're also going to be kind of mechanizing this part in the future years. There's going to be a conveyor belt here instead of that table. Um, but, but we have a much, a much bigger walk-in cooler. We're hoping that this can ser serve as a um, central distribution point for some of the local oysters so other growers can bring their oysters here and we can get them on trucks. The trucks just come to our place because we have loading docks. Uh, that's a, that's, I think those are the only loading docks for any of the oyster companies on the uh, Narrastead River. So we're going to try to work out something where other people can bring their product there and the trucks taken into Boston and, and elsewhere can pick them up there. Um, this part of the building, this 50 by 50 foot uh, part, is called the OIR, which stands for the Oyster Inventory Room. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. This, however, is there, there are two levels on this building. The packing area and this OIR are all uh, raised you know, about that much higher than this level of the building. The, all of the lower part of the building, going in that side door and down towards the back, towards the river, is all focused on microalgae production. So we're moving all of our, uh, the, the thing that we do that's different with our microalgae is we actually grow our, our algae in a clean room using sugar. We use fermentation technology. To go in and work on our cultures, you have to gown up and put on you know, gloves and booties and, and uh, go in there. You can't allow any bacteria or mold spores to get in the cultures, otherwise they crash. So that was the thing that took us so long the last decade, was figuring out how to do that and keeping these cultures so we can harvest and refill them every seven days and keep them going pretty much indefinitely. So this is the only time you'll ever be able to see a picture of this because once we start using it, it'll be sealed off to the public. But that's the, that gives you an idea of the size of our clean room. That, I think it's like 60 some odd feet long by 25 or 30 feet wide. This is the uh, inventory room. And that, that uh, 50 by 50 foot part of the building has four in-ground tanks, 50 feet long, uh, 10 feet wide, and about 8 feet deep. That's my son calling it. <laughs> um, and 50 feet, uh, 50 feet long, 10, uh, 8 feet deep, and 10 feet wide. And then above each of these tanks, there are seven stacks of three bins, like these here. And basically, this holds 26,000 gallons of water. Uh, there's a pumping system. That this is a big protein skimmer down here. And, and there's a pump that pumps the water up out of the bottom of the tank through this manifold. And then there's seven drops that drop water down into the top of these bins. And there's, spe there's a special flow pattern down through them to, to uh, maximize oxygen uh, you know, throughout the, the tank. And the oysters are actually held in trays that nest down in each of these things. So um, this will allow us to hold in that in that 50 by 50 foot room, we'll be able to hold up to a half a million oysters at one time from there. Um, and, and these are all separate, for, there are four of these tanks, you can drive a forklift over them. Uh, the, each of them is heavily insulated, it, has a, it can be temperature controlled, so, uh, and all the water that we're using in this facility comes from the hatchery through that head tank that I showed you. We, we actually pump the water up underground through a whole array of pipes, and we can control how many pipes it goes through to take advantage of the, uh, 
uh, you know, in gra the, the groundwater temperature basically on the way up. So if we want to cool the water off in the summer, we slow it down, run it through a bunch of pipes, and it comes out colder than what it is in our head tank. And this time of year, we can warm it up. Uh, and actually, we've been testing that, and it seems to be working pretty well. So the other big thing that we did is, uh, let's see, spring, or rather fall of 2016, we made a big decision. For a small company like ours, um, to, we decided that we really needed to have uh, somebody who was focused on research and development. I mean, we've done a lot of it throughout the whole history of the company, but uh, when you look at the things that we believe we're facing in the future, um, we wanted to make sure that we were in a position to be ready for those things, but also to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that they afford. So, for example, one of the things on this R&D list is development of a microalgae concentrate for sale. Well, we're betting, for, number one, there's very little um, competition. There's one other company in the U.S. that we know of that produces a microalgae concentrate. And, and there's been a lot of, uh, we've used it before, there's some quality issues that we've heard of, and we know that the way we do our microalgae, we, we produce a very, very consistent, high quality microalgae cell that has really good biochemistry with lipid levels and all that. So we want to convert that into a whole other part of our business. And, uh, and again, that kind of gets to that resiliency thing that have, we want to have lots of ways we can go in case we get slammed upside the head again with, by something that we're not quite ready for. Um, we're very, very, we, we really work, worked a whole lot on how to control larval production in the hatchery and dealing with, uh, you know, seawater chemistry. Um, we, we actually have uh, now a, a fairly sophisticated uh, it's a very sophisticated seawater monitoring, you know, chemistry uh, system in the hatchery. That's that every 10 seconds is is making measurements of salinity, temperature, uh, dissolved oxygen, t um, and and the carbon dioxide levels in the water, and it calculates the saturation levels of of, of, uh, of calcium carbonate. And the, the reason for doing that, it's not we don't use that in the everyday management of our operations. However. It's a really important part of trying to figure out what's going to be happening and the impact of, of uh, carbonate chemistry in particular on things we haven't really looked at yet. So for example, what we're really focused on and hope, hopefully going to be doing over the next couple of years is a project where we, we take uh, juvenile oysters, a cohort of juvenile oysters, or several cohorts, but we, we're, we're going to be co hopefully collaborating with a, a hatchery down in uh, Chesapeake Bay each of us is going to take those oysters and put them into a semi-field, semi-manipulated uh, system where we're, we're looking at um, allowing the natural variability of the food in the water, pumping, pumping water through <coughs> these three tanks, and, in, and the only thing we're doing is we're manipulating the carbon dioxide levels so that the oysters are experiencing the natural variability in the environment in terms of temperature, food, salinity, all that stuff. <coughs> the only thing we're doing is we're in one, in one tank, we're gonna have a control, one tank we're gonna uh, remove carbon dioxide from, from the water, and the other tank we're gonna add it. For, and, and, and basically <coughs> be able to measure, we've already kind of figured out the, te the techniques for measuring these, the, the calcification rates of these really small oysters. And what we're interested in finding out is are we or are we not being affected with the seed that we put out into the hatchery by the, the lowering pH and by the ocean acidification, coastal acidification? And if, if not, great, you know, then we're, we're going to stop worrying about it so much. But I don't suspect, I think we are going to be seeing calcification rates that are linked <coughs> to the carbonate chemistry. And then the question becomes, well, at what point does it become critical? And how does, it be, how does that manifest itself? Do we all of a sudden start shipping our oysters to New York and the chefs are calling up and saying that, hey, you know, every time we try to shuck these oysters, they're breaking on us and we, you know, we don't want any more? That, that's one thing I worry about. Uh, but anyway, our goal is to understand what's happening before those kind of things take place and be able to try to correct it. Um, we're obviously, we're working constantly on optimizing our culture uh, medium and, and being able to produce more algal cells per square foot. 
Uh, we're developing um, the, the, the tasks that we're involved in here are figuring out the best way to concentrate and preserve and store the concentrated cells, which will allow us to decouple food production. That's something that has never really happened in shellfish aquaculture. If you think about other forms of agriculture and even aquaculture, you know, the food production is separate from the actual husbandry of the animals. That's not true in shellfish aquaculture to, to any great extent. And so that's what we're really trying to do is be able to produce food separately from that and not have to do it in real time as we're growing the animals. Um, we've actually, I could probably cross that one off the list. We've sort of done that. Would you agree with that, Amanda? I think we kind of nailed that one. But we, over the last couple of years, we, we started testing this, and we got that to a point where, again, we're able to grow probably all the larvae we need to grow in a cohort pretty much in two 200-liter tanks that you know, take up this much room. It's pretty incredible. Um, this is a big thing with that, that new room, uh, the OIR. We're looking at uh, the ways, it, you know, the, the concept is this, and it's something that we would want to share widely because we think it's a really horrible thing in our industry if somebody eats oysters and gets sick. It kind of puts the, you know, cold, it's a cold water bath on the whole industry, really. So um, what we're looking at is the idea of being able to hold oysters at cool temperatures. You remember I said those tanks, we can uh, hold them, we can control the temperature. So the idea is that you hold them at a temperature probably around 50 degrees Fahrenheit where the oysters are still metabolically really active, they're pumping, and by providing them with food, you can actually accelerate their pumping rate. There's a, there's a correlation between cell density and actual filtration rate, and we actually did some work on that already, and we identified uh, the cell density where we got the maximum uh, filtration rate at those, um, at those temperatures. And, and then the idea is that you bring oysters in that may have Vibrio perihemolyticus, which just in case you don't know what that is, it's a pretty, pretty much ubiquitous marine bacteria and some of the pathogenic strains have been increasing and, uh, in their prevalence as seawater temperatures have, have come up. And we're seeing more and more illnesses that are correlated with this rising seawater temperature. And the problem for us with this is that if, uh, if there is an FDA-defined FDA outbreak of disease, which means that in a growing area, two independent illnesses, am I saying this right, Cole? Two, two independent, she wasn't paying attention. <laughs> two, two independent illnesses, you know, in other words, if you sell to you know, family X and two people get sick, that wouldn't be, and it, that's just one, one illness whereas it would have to be a couple different families. But if it's linked to that growing area, then the FDA shuts the growing area down to harvesting. And as I understand it, there's not a really clear protocol for how you reopen that. And when it happened in the past, they waited in Duxbury, I think, until the water temperature dropped below 60 degrees. So that, that is one of the, the biggest risks that I feel we need to try to control and figure out. So, so that, this is a really big priority for us. And then, and then obviously, um, we're constantly looking at new systems and ways to improve our seed production. Um, and Meredith White, is, uh, she has her uh, PhD from Woods Hole and is the head of our R&D, and she's been doing a great job. Um, and is, you know, every day, she's in charge of all the seawater monitoring, and she's written a bunch of proposals, some of which we had funded. Uh, we did get a, uh, a main... Um, uh, capital grants uh, award to work on some of the this, this project concentrating and uh, you know well it's actually for the whole facility but uh, what we're going to be focused on with some of those funds is getting the infrastructure to be able to concentrate and uh, store and preserve this microalgae so to kind of wrap it up I want to talk a little bit about capitalism um, <coughs> And I think this is an amazing quote. This is Henry Ford. There is one rule uh, for the industrialists, and that is make the best quality of goods possible at the lowest cost possible, paying the highest wages possible. Um, that's kind of, the, the, that is where the root of stakeholder capitalism comes from. And basically, you know, we're mostly, I believe, in a shareholder capitalist mode now, where, where corporations feel 
primarily beholden to shareholders and dividends and all that. Um, we believe that uh, it's important to be a stakeholder capitalist company, which means that our responsibility extends beyond the shareholders. The employees are key, vendors, bankers, customers, the environment, all of those are equally important. And, and, and I cannot uh, overemphasize, you know, one of the things that's been the, the most rewarding and um, important lessons I've learned going through this career is how important it is to, um, to get a good workforce, to get a good team together, and to, and to build it as a team so everybody works together. And, uh, and I, can't, I have to say that you know, we, what the, the crew that I have working down at Mook Sea Farm right now is phenomenal. I mean, they're really, really sharp people. Um, everybody that works there uh, you know, goes above and beyond. Uh, so in order to do that, you have to pay people a living wage, provide benefits, and, um, and that is, to me, one of the most rewarding things about doing this, even though I do like oysters. So I will, I think that's a pretty good time to stop, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Gosh, what a couple decades difference. Um, I'm curious about the microalgae micro concentration, because we've had trouble with reed also with contamination. Are you thinking it's going to get online this year? Uh, we're, we're hoping that the earliest that we would imagine um, having a product available would be early next year. Wow. Are you doing rhodomonas as well? Or right now, uh, it, we would start with the, the ones that we do heterotrophically, which are yeah. the tetracellins. Okay. No, that's good. Um, Michael, so when you're holding these oysters at colder temperatures, um, is the idea that they would then purge the embryo from the well, okay, I didn't really get into that. That's yeah. it's, So we actually did a trial that, that behaved. It didn't completely get rid of the Vibrio, but it, 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 uh, the levels that we measured afterwards exactly match what we predict. And what, so the idea is that you're feeding them, you're, you're promoting the filtration, and you're basically purging, it, you know, getting it out of their gut tracts and getting it out of them, just like a depuration process. But, but it turns out, I believe that the feeding is going to be a crucial part of that. And, but, the, but the one challenge that we're facing with that is that this high, very, very high level of um, variability in the, within the replicants. So, and what, what we think is happening is that, uh, so when, when we did this trial, we sort of set up a scaled down version of that room in our broodstock room last summer, summer before last. And, um, and, and what we tried to do is we put the oysters in there and we just tracked them for a week. We sampled the oysters at the end and at various points in, in between. We, we sampled the water and we sampled the feces in the bottom of the tank. And we found very high levels of the vibrio of the feces, which is what we wanted to see. What we think is that this, you know, what happens is you'll, you'll look at a, six oysters and you'll, and you'll look at the vibrio levels in those six oysters and you'll have some that are very low and then one that'll just be through the roof. And, and what we think is happening is that it has to do with where those oysters are positioned, whether it's in a growing system out in the river or in, our, in this kind of a system, whether they were in the layer at the bottom. And because what happens is all the poop goes down on those and they're just kind of recycling them. So and when we did the sampling that first time, we weren't really thinking about that. So we had um, some high variability within the replicates that we did for each of the, the treatments that we did. Um, yet we saw the averages were very uh, consistent with uh, you know, the, the one that we didn't feed at all didn't do very well, and then there was a, a trend with the filtration rate, you know, the, the cell concentration, that, uh, which is exactly what we would expect based on what we had decided or figured out was the optimal filtration rate for cell density. Does that help? Yeah, so cool. Would, um, with your system that you're using, do you think there's an opportunity or potential for phyto remediation? And if so, do you think it's promising? You mean for so bringing in oysters that may be tainted by a harmful algal bloom? And Where you're actually using seaweed, perhaps, to mitigate some... Oh, oh, oh okay, sorry. 
I'm shifting gears. So somebody who can talk about that just walked in. So I think it's an important thing to be looking at. Um, the, 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 the cautions that I have would be that, for one thing, there are seaweeds that can be grown at warm temperatures. Nobody's really working very much with those now. And, and you know, our growing season is basically from late April at the earliest until sometime in October. So that, that doesn't sync up with when sugar kelp is being grown. So that's a, a bit of a problem. I think that there may, the, the one thing I will say about oysters is that it's such a high value crop. I and mean, you know, the wholesale value is over half a dollar per oyster. That, that as long as you could grow something in proximity to that grid system that you saw in that big area, in that drone shot, um, you know, if you could grow a seaweed crop that even had low value but paid for itself, you know, that would be worth doing. The other thing that we're thinking about is using very finely, you know, basically have buffer pods within that grid that uh, where as the tide comes in and flows through, uh, you're dissolving, uh, you're buffering the water as, it, as it's going through the, all the oysters. So there's lots of things to look at, but my point is we need to make sure that the federal agencies that can, can do all this R&D are well funded and, and we start looking at it. And uh, looking at oysters has become a big thing in the last few years. And other states are really starting to involve in it too. Do you see anywhere in the future here where there'd be a glut that would be a big problem? So the, yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I think about that a lot, probably once or twice a week. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of mulling that over. And here's my take on it, and I, I'm not saying it's right. Uh, I think, so there, this oyster renaissance actually began, and I would, I would uh, give credit to uh, VIMS, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and Rutgers University. They were the ones that developed these uh, disease-resistant oysters that are now basically what's allowing the industry to flourish. And then on top of that, uh, there's been this continued growth and demand for half-shell, high-quality half-shell oysters that, is a, that went right on through the Great Recession and is continuing. The answer to your question is I think at some point it's possible that um, there could be that. And, and there, we may see little bits of it here and there you know, uh, at, at various times. I mean, there's certainly, even now, there are times when the supply seems to exceed the, the demand you know, for periods of the year. Um, but what I will say, the optimistic part of me says that I think there's a lot of scope for increasing per capita consumption in the United States. And, and, I, and I have two reasons for that. One is, um, if you look at the oyster consumption back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, everybody in the United States ate oysters. Now, granted, they were cheap. Uh, however, it was really a commodity. There were train loads of oysters being harvested and shipped all over the U.S. out of the Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay. Secondly, France, which is a lot smaller than the United States, produces 10 times more oysters than we do, just France. And, you know, they, so, so the per capita consumption has room to grow. So the real question is, can we oyster growers grow, you know, grow the pie rather than fighting over the pieces? So we need to promote that and do, do things that are going to keep that per capita consumption growing. Thank you. Thank you very much.